by the time we get to the Pro Bowl, you think I feel like playing another football game that means right. nothing? Right. No. But the right. only reason I went to everyone is, first of all, you were voted in, which is an honor. And two, my family loved to go. It was yeah. like something I could see the pride in them that we were all there together. Yeah. And and I think that I've, I've just, I've just, you know, learned that success is, is just meant to be shared. And, and the more successful you are, the more you should share it and try to bring more people with you. Because there's a lot of room at the top of the hill, man. There, it's not like the top of the hill is a point. The top of the hill is flat and everybody can stand up there. That's really good. No one's ever said that on my show. It's one of the most powerful things anybody's ever said. Welcome back to the show, everybody. I'm so excited. I have today, this is a man I've admired for a very long time. I think he's one of the great American success stories, regardless of industry. The ironic part is he didn't really grow up most of the time in the United States, and he becomes this incredible success. He could also probably like double as a Dos Equis man, like the most interesting man in the world because of the, <laughs> because of the diversity of the different enterprises he's involved with. He's an entrepreneur. He's got an unbelievable deal right now. He's doing with suits with the men's warehouse. He's got this documentary right now or a series called Morbid an Athlete on ESPN+. Plus. He's got a management and production company called Smack. He, uh, oh, by the way, he hosts Good Morning America, the $100,000 Pyramid, Fox NFL Sunday. And, oh, he's an NFL Hall of Famer, the single season sack leader, Super Bowl champion. I, don't, I can't even believe I'm saying all this about one human being, but I am. <laughs> so, Michael Strahan, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you, man. Thank you. I appreciate you having me. The show's over. I took all the time right there. Just <laughs> That's incredible. With that, with that intro, I guess. But, but yeah, I can't believe you're saying all that stuff or anybody um, says all that stuff about me. But I'm I'm grateful and I'm happy that um, I've had the life that I have and, and have had the experience of the things that I've experienced. You know, the other thing I just have to tell you is I, I want everyone ever wants to know how do I do some of the things you've done in, in their own way. But the other thing, Michael, is just, you know, we and I have so many mutual friends and and you've been kind to me as well. But just no one has a bad word to say about you. You know, everybody that I meet, they just have wonderful things to say. I see your face change, but it's <laughs> true. I've just literally never heard anything but kind and great things about you. And you've been that way to me, too. So let me ask you, when you're growing up, you're kind of you're in Germany most of the time. And, and I know you came back here in Houston for a while, but did any of this, was any of this a plan? No, absolutely not. My biggest plan when I left um, Germany to, I moved in with my uncle. I stayed with my uncle for like five months or so to get a football scholarship. Cause my dad sent me back to stay with my uncle. And he said, yeah, you're going to get a football scholarship. He just said, you're going to, you're going to do it. He, my dad never said if it was always like when, when, when. So when he said, you're going to do it, I'd never doubted it. I was so naive about failure that, okay, I'm going to get a football scholarship. I'll get one. I come back, I get a scholarship. And then everything was like just the next step. What was the next step from getting a scholarship was, okay, finally going to college. And then once I'm in college, you know, um, not just being a football player or being a part of a team, but like trying to be the best at it because, you know, anyone can do something, but if you're going to do it, why not put all your effort into it? And that's just kind of been how I've been about everything. I never really had a plan. My biggest plan was just never having to move back in with my parents. Yeah. That was it. But that almost happened, right? Like I, it's funny in life, we get really close. There's like moments that determine our destiny in our life. Mm -hmm. It's very you know, one decision, one relationship, one meeting away from really changing your life. And was I was prepping for this, I'm like, man, after your freshman year of college, didn't you kind of go back to Germany? Am I getting this right? And you oh, yeah. literally almost quit. If that happens, this is probably most of what I just introduced, probably all of it never happens if you follow through with that decision. So you were that one decision away. Tell us about that, what happened in your conversation with your dad. Well, I think that I followed through, none of it, none of it happens. I, I was like a lot of kids. I was homesick and I was just ready to go back to Germany. I had my girlfriend and, you know, you're missing your girlfriend, you're missing your friends, you're missing your mom and dad and, and everyone else. So for me, I just wanted, I wanted to go home. Yeah. College at that point to me seemed like, okay, I got the football scholarship. That didn't mean I needed to complete it. I did it. <laughs> 
<laughs> so, so I go home and my and I was literally at I'm, I'm there at home. School has started like two weeks had gone by already. Oh my gosh. And then my dad comes in one day and he goes, Hasn't school started? And I'm like, Yeah. He said, Well, what are you doing? Shouldn't you be back? And I'm going, Yeah, yeah but you know, I decided I'm not going back. And he looked at me and he goes, What are you gonna do? I said, Well, I'm gonna stay here. I'm I'll get a job. And he looked at me again, his voice got deeper than mine. And he said, what are you going to do? Mm. And bam, light bulb went off. Mm. First of all, I can't stay here. Yeah. And second, secondly, you have to, at some point, grow up and take care of yourself. Your parents give you all the tools. And I had been fantastic parents who gave me everything that I needed to be on my own. Now it was time for me to apply those things. So it just, a light bulb went off in my head that, okay, you can't stay home. You, right. You're going back to school. When you get to school, since you got to be there, work hard at it. Just don't yeah. be another student. Just don't be another athlete. If you're going to do it, be your best that you can be at it. Were you and, surprised when you got there? I was in college, but maybe you surprised by this in the NFL too. You get this opportunity to play college football. And by the way, the other thing, too, is he's at a historically black college. It's Texas Southern, yeah. right? That's where yeah, you Texas are. Southern. So, I mean, this is not like pathway to the NFL, right? Like, this is not, you know, you're, I think you're the only NFL Hall of Famer from Texas Southern, I think. Am I right about yeah. that? Yeah. yeah. So you're, you're far away. But it surprised me, even when I got into business or I got into, I played college baseball, and you, you had this in the NFL. Aren't you surprised by somehow – the, the the lack of work ethic, even of people that have these great yeah. opportunities. And was that what separated you, do you think? Uh, yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I was amazed by the guy who has so much talent. Yeah. Just refused to expand it, refused to like perfect it. As, and you're never going to be perfect, but at least strive to perfect the talent that you were given. And I found that guys who weren't as talented seemed to go further because they worked harder. And yeah. I, I mean, Ed, I'm in an HBCU, not a football factory at Texas Southern University. I didn't know, you know, what the way out of there, where the path led for me once school was over. I didn't know it, it was going to lead to the NFL. I just knew that this is where I was and I was going to work hard at it. Yeah. And once I was a senior and, uh, and started seeing the scouts and hearing from the scouts, I started to go, well, maybe I have a shot. But I never thought that I was, it was legit until I got that call on draft day. But I saw so many guys who were more talented than me, who weren't, just didn't push themselves, didn't work hard. But once our senior year rolled around and they realized that after this year, I'm no longer on scholarship, then they wanted to work out. That's exactly what I saw too. Yep. The scouts are coming here now yep. to see, to see they be honest with you, they were coming to see me. You're asking me to let you in on my workouts you didn't earn the right to be honest with you. Mm. And, and so to see guys scramble because they didn't prepare ahead of time gave, was a great lesson for me in everything that I do. Do not ever be in a situation where you regret not putting in the work when it comes time for that final product to present itself. It's so All interesting to me. I think for people listening to this, it's you guys, this is guys at a historically black college. He goes back to Germany. He's this not coming back. This guy becomes the all time NFL sack leader. Arguably one of the great, not arguably, legitimately one of the greatest NFL football players of all time, the all-time season sack leader, 22 and a half. I'm going to ask you about Favre later. I got to know about that play. But it's just mind-blowing to me because I think a lot of people that listen to my show or watch, like, I just feel so far away from where I need to get. And I think there's just these steps. It's almost like God prepares you when you get into certain spaces, if you'll outwork everybody mm -hmm. with the answers, with the right stuff. And I'm just curious for you, you show up in New York to the New York football giants and LT's there arguably another guy, maybe the goat of all time, at least on the defensive side of the I football. So. Now you're comparing those skill sets, but then also in your media life, you walk into a studio, you're not like an NYU, you know, media major person. Have you struggled with self doubt? Cause you seem so confident on the outside. Have you struggled with self doubt playing football in your broadcasting career as an entrepreneur? And if you have, what do you do to overcome it? I struggle with every bit of it. From football, football especially, even when I was having my, some of my greatest years, I was struggling with doubt. I'm in a game thinking to myself, 
can I do this? Am I really that good? Maybe this is the guy who will just gonna just throw me around and take advantage of me and I won't be effective against this guy in this game. Like I I, I struggle with that most of the time. Wow. And quite a bit. And even TV, I absolutely struggle with it. But I always say you will doubt yourself more than anyone else will ever doubt you. Mm -hmm. Self-doubt trumps any doubt that any outside person will ever have in you. For me, I've learned to just try my best to push through it, understand that everything is not going to be successful. And if it isn't, don't get down about it. You learn from it. You push through it. You move on to the next thing and the next opportunity. And I've struggled with self-doubt all the time. I, I still do. I'm on TV half the time and I'm thinking, oh, am I really good at this? Or are people just blowing smoke up my, you know what? My, do I, am I really cut out for this? Because I watch other people come into this business on a different path from bigger schools, from, you know, their opportunities and the way they got there seem more traditional. Yeah. And I'm so untraditional with being there that I struggle with feeling if I do belong. And, and but I look at it and I think it's natural. It's natural. And I'm just happy that um, the world, a different type of world, especially now, like news, for instance, no one coming from my background would ever be on a Good Morning in America or any other morning program because it seemed as if you had to look a certain way, um, have a certain background. And, and, and deliver it in a certain way. But I think the world has changed when people want to have their news delivered from a from a different type of person. You know, you have that traditional person and you have someone who may be a little non-traditional, but maybe who makes a better connection with you to make you feel as if it's more real. And that, that's so, a party that's interesting. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but no, no, no. I'm blown away that you have self-doubt to this day. Absolutely. Anyway, because I do too. And I, People, I think sometimes if I'm walking, there's 25,000 people and I'm speaking, they're like, are you nervous? Are you scared? Yeah, I have like major imposter syndrome. Like, why do these people want to listen to me yeah. at this stage of my life? Like, why would they listen to me? They have no idea what a dork I am, right? I'm about to- And half the time, I'm like, can't get my kids to listen to me, but I have other kids. <laughs> I relate to that too. <laughs> but yeah, that's big time. But I'm curious, like, do you have imposter syndrome too? Like you walk in to interview Barack Obama, which you've done. What did that feel like? Like, are you walking in? I've had these moments, and I've met President Obama, too. You, you, I've met a couple of these guys. But you, I'm like, what am I doing here? Or is it now that you're so far down the road, Emmys, entrepreneurship, Fox, you've dominated there, you know, good morning. Are you now like, all right, now I know I belong here. Or even then, are you like, oh, my gosh. You still are, oh, my gosh. You still are. No matter how much stuff you've done, Sometimes, you know, when I when I saw President Obama, I had met him before. So it wasn't like the first time, but it's still, I mean, this is the former president. This is like yeah. former Obama. So you right. still walk in a little, little nervous, a little on the sire side, trying to fill out the situation, but he's always been great. You know, Michelle has always been great, but you still are a little bit nervous. I, I think. That makes me more nervous than doing more hard, harder news stories when it comes mm -hmm. to like interviewing Jonathan Manley, one of the officers in the Brianna Taylor case and, and things like that. I'm so locked in and focused on it that it's a totally different thing. Whereas with, you know, President Obama, it's like, okay, there's politics involved. There's his ideas involved, but there's also a certain coolness factor that you have to be aware of. So... But I love it. That's what I love about doing what I do now. It's so diverse. It's no, not one thing. I, I know my personality. And if I, had, if I had to do the same thing over and over again, I would get bored if it never changed. And that was a great thing about football that every day I felt like I was learning. 15 years in the pros, I felt like I learned every day until I stopped playing. And I watch now and I'm still learning stuff as a spectator. Mm -hmm. And that's what I love about what I do now. Everything's different. There's a new challenge every day. There's issues and problems you got to work through. It's fun. You, what time did you get up this morning? Five. You got up at five. Okay, so I just want everyone to see people that become successful, they have to manage time really, really well. And I was, I'm thinking I'm a pretty busy person. Like I got a lot of stuff going on. And I was thinking this man's light. I watched you last week. I think, were you in LA for the, for the football game on Thursday? Where were you last Thursday? Yeah. Yeah. You're in LA on Thursday. You have GMA. Then you got to do the Sunday, the Sunday football program. 
Then you're going to come back and do GMA. I know Constance and Smack, she's wearing you out and the agency was stuff to pay attention to, right? I know Con's doing that. Then you got all the other stuff you're doing. You got your production company. You got the deal going on. You got this stupid interview with me. You have all these things. How do you manage your time? Do you have an actual strategy? Is it the people around you? How do you manage your time and your energy? I will, I will give, I will have to say it's the people around me. And I have a great team of people. You named Constance and, and Jasmine and Jose and, and Nisha. And, and we just have a great team of people who we work with who, who allow me to be able to focus on what I do for my core, core side of my personal business. Mm-hmm. And, and then also be involved in our collective business. But also they don't, I, I will tell them or they will tell me, you're doing too much mm-hmm. and we're going to cut back. Especially now when when we have GMA in the morning, then I have to go Thursday night football, Sunday football, fly back on a flight every Sunday. So back and forth to L.A. 20 something weeks in a row. You, you can you can wear yourself out if you're not careful with all the extra things. And and my assistant Jasmine is is, is she and I were just having a conversation yesterday. And if I feel it or if she feels it, she'll say, OK. It's pullback. I feel like it's just too much stuff. And sometimes you need people to save you from yourself. Yeah. You know, it's like an athlete who's injured, but you're like, I can do it. One yeah. for the gipper. And that's the same way that I am. I do stuff away off the field now and in my life now. It's like kind of with that football player athlete mentality that you can do it all. And sometimes yeah. you need people to say, you know what, you can, but why? Pull back, relax. It's going to be here tomorrow and just pace yourself. The pacing myself has really saved me. What about your workouts? You, you're fit. You're, I watch you on the show. I'm not, I feel like I'm br- like bragging on you too much, but <laughs> I watch you on the show and I'm like, this dude is, looks so good in this suit. He's obviously still extremely fit. You and I both know most of our former athlete friends that don't have your schedule, that don't have your time demands, <laughs> don't keep it together. We both know this, right? Most of these are dudes that you played with. Yeah. What do you do for your fitness? Because you're up at five, right? I'm curious. When do you train? Are you conscious of what you're putting in your body or are you just like a genetic freak that you're very blessed oh. at your age to look this good? I wish I was a genetic freak, man. I really do. I, I, get, I get envious of guys who have the six packs and all that. And they don't do anything. They roll out of bed, eat a bowl of cereal. But I have to be very, <laughs> I have to be conscious of everything I eat. I have to work out. I try to at least one hour a day. I feel like if I can work out an hour a day, I got 23 hours to do anything else that I want to do. And But you have to find the time. And, and you have to prioritize the time and you can't be lazy. The hour that I'm sitting on the couch thinking about working out and watching some TV program, the workout could have been over. And that's how I rationalize it. But it's, it's about scheduling my time. Like today, a GMA this morning, the second I leave the studio, I drive to New Jersey so my barber can cut my hair. Then I drive back. I'm going to do this podcast with you. Then I have a one o'clock doctor appointment. Then I'm going to work out right after the doctor because at 530, I got to go screen a movie and then I'll come, you know, so it's like you have to find the little pockets of time that you have and and, and get it in. And then there are days where you know, I'll do that workout. And I have a pocket of time, that pocket of time, maybe a nap, that pocket of time, maybe reading a magazine or reading a book, that pocket of time, maybe just watching mindless TV. But I just try to do things that certain at certain points you gotta let I working out for me is like a, a release. It, it's like that moment where everything else outside of the music that's in my ears when I work out, that's the only thing I'm hearing at that point. Yeah, same with me. That's really good to hear that you watch a little mindless TV. It makes me and a lot of other people feel good, just that you unplug your brain for a while yeah. to disconnect. I'm curious about your ability to be present. If you struggle with this or things you do as a busy person too, sometimes I have struggled in the past, even with my kids with when I'm at home thinking about a business deal I've got, or, you know, um, I'm at, you know, you're in a smack meeting for your production and management company, but you know, you got to prep for an interview tomorrow on GMA, right? Like that, this presence thing, because one thing everyone says about you to me is he's charismatic. Right. And I do believe you're one of the more charismatic people on the planet. I think part of charisma is being present with people and giving them all of your energy when you're in that moment with them, like they're the only person in the world that matters. You're incredible at that. Do you do anything specific to be present? Are you like conscious of it or do you struggle with that too? No, I'm kind of where I am is where I am. 
But you're right about that. It, it takes a lot of energy. And I didn't realize that and I'm not consciously, I don't consciously have to think, let me be in the moment. Uh, right. I just think that I'm just built to be in the moment. And I also think that I'm able to compartment, compartmentalize things because on the football field, something bad happens. I got to move on to the next. If we can have this conversation on the sideline and they say defense, I grab my helmet. Hold on. I'll be right back. Put on my helmet. I run out there, completely switched to a totally different dude. Finish, come back, put my helmet down and pick up the conversation. Like it never stopped. Like to be able to stop and start, you know, and compartmentalize my thoughts and wherever I'm at and what actions are needed in that moment. I've, I've just, I had to learn that, but I learned that from football and that has really helped me in everything else that I do. But you're right. Whenever I am into something, I'm into it and I'm focused on it, but it takes a lot of energy. Mm. And I've realized that as I've gotten older, that in order to, you know, that's why certain things I just know, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to go to that event. I just can't go to dinner I because I know it's going to take a lot of energy out of me. And the problem is I can't help myself. It's not like I can go there and say, I'm just going to sit in the corner quiet and let everyone else, let everyone else talk. And handle. I can't, I got to be in the mix and I got to be involved. And that's my fault. But also it's also my responsibility to know, okay, this is going to take too much out of me. And I need time to recharge my battery because I know that when I'm in that room, that room's going to get everything that I got. Oh, good. I, if, brag for a minute, Michael, for me. This is so good, brother. Um, why are you successful? I mean, I mean, like, don't do the humble G golly thing. Like, you've been so successful at many things. If I were your son, I met your daughter, by the way, one of them. I, 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 what would you say to me? Like, I'm successful because you did an amazing job as a father, too. So I am successful more than most people because what would the answer be? Because I am successful, more successful than most people, because I am able to be myself. And I, God, that's, that's such a good question, man. I kind of have an answer, but I kind of don't. Okay. I think a lot of it is being incredibly lucky in a lot of ways. Now you're going to the humble card. Don't do no, that. No, right place, right time. Okay. I, I do think because I work my ass off. Like I work. I don't, I work. Mm -hmm. I'm not afraid to work. Mm -hmm. I don't take myself too seriously. I think that has helped me because if I did, I wouldn't have, I wouldn't have a gap in my teeth. You know, I had the sucker fix a long time ago. Like <laughs> what you see is what you get. I'm, I'm confident in what I know I know. Mm -hmm. So I'm always nervous with a new job. So nervous with TV and so nervous playing football when I was younger. But once I had experience of something and I know I'm, I can do it, then I'm confident in it. And, yeah. you, and, and, and I know I'm good at it. Mm -hmm. But still, that doesn't mean I don't have doubts every once in a while about it. But when you first start out, of course, you have doubts. But I always tell myself and people say, I'm so nervous my first time and I said, well, think about the person who is in your position that you do, who, who you look at, you admire, who do what, who does what you want to do. They had a first day too. Yeah. Everybody had a beginning of a career and people completely forget that. So I've learned to tell myself that at things that are new to me, but I just figured things out. I think that's why I'm successful. I figured things out. There's no excuse. There's nothing. If I want it, I'll figure it out and get it. I've never once seen anybody or been jealous of anybody's success or been mad that this person have this and I don't have it. Because if I want it, I'll work to figure out a way to go get it legally, you know? Right. right. You know what I observe about you that is people that I admire and people that I actually like to be around is they tow a really unique line. It's such a nuance worth having tremendous self-confidence combined with a big dose of humility. And it's such a unique line because most people struggle with self-confidence. They're humble. They've got yeah. humility. They struggle with the confidence piece. These guys that didn't work when they got to the NFL, for example, right? People that you and I kind of see burn out. We go, what do they have? They got all the self-confidence, nothing about humility. They don't want to be coached. They don't know they got to outwork everybody. Yeah. And I noticed that in you in droves. It's, um, I, I also feel like Michael, one thing I observe about you is it people are always feeling something from us. So you're always making someone feel something. 
Mm -hmm. And the happiest and most successful people are conscious sometimes of how they're making other people feel. And me, you're outstanding at that on camera, off camera. I watched you last year. I won't say who, but it's someone we both know with another NFL football player who was on Fox with you now. And it just wasn't coming quite as naturally to him as it did the other guys in there. And I watched you kind of giving him the energy. You, you even pulled him along like as a teammate, almost like you were still on the line, you know, working as a unit, as a group. Are you conscious of that energy thing? Or is this just a natural thing? If I met you when you were a freshman in college, you had it then, you had it when you were a rookie, you had it when you were playing the Patriots in the Super Bowl, you had it with Kelly, you had it on GMA, or is it something you're kind of intentional about the energy piece? I recognize energy because I've never wanted to be the guy that walked in the room and people go, oh no. You know, you want to be the guy who walks in the room and people are excited to be there. When I see other people who may, I, I just, I think I'm sympathetic and empathy, I have empathy and sympathy for I people. Do. So when I see someone who's struggling or someone I feel can do something better, and if I can do something to bring that out, I'll go out of my way to bring it out. I'll do it at my expense sometimes. Like I don't, I don't really have the the ego to say everything's about me and you know, my name's got to be there. I don't care. I don't care who speaks first. I don't care whose name's on the title. I don't care about that stuff. I just want to do great work because I'm a, I'm a true believer that if, if the work is good, everybody, and if the work is winning, everybody gets enough, there's enough credit for everybody. So for me, when it comes to work and, and, and energy and people and trying to help, that's just more from a mentality of, of the teamwork mentality. And I just really sincerely want people to do well. And I've never been a guy who isn't happy to be in whatever room that I'm in. Mm. And I just want people to enjoy that I'm in that room. And I also want to enjoy the people in that room. And, and when you had success, I think the more success I've had, the more I've been into making, not caring about my success. I've cared more about other people's success. I've cared more about other people feeling good about where they are and where we are and, and the things that we're doing together. And I think that that's important because at some point, you know, football, I've had, you know, every uh, trophy that I ever thought about. I remember in college, didn't know how to play football when I first went to TSU out of high school. I'm one year high school coming from Germany. And by the time I left college, HBCU, Defensive Player of the Year, and a few times I won everything. Then I get these trophies, and where do they go? To my parents. Is that right? It mean much to me. It was like, oh, I think I'm doing it. I thought I was doing it for myself, and I wasn't. Get to the pros. You think you're gonna, you, you know, I want to make the Pro Bowl. You make the Pro Bowl, and you're like, oh, this is gonna be great. But what, by the time we get to the Pro Bowl, you think I feel like playing another football game that means right. nothing? Right. No. But the only reason I went to everyone is, first of all, you were voted in, which is an honor. And two, my family loved to go. It was yeah. like something I could see the pride in them that we were all there together. Yeah. And, and I think that I've, I've, just, I've just, you know, learned that success is, is just meant to be shared. And, and the more successful you are, the more you should share it and try to bring more people with you. That's because profound. there's a lot of room at the top of the hill, man. There, it's not like the top of the hill is a point. Top of the hill is flat, and everybody can stand up there. Well, that's really good. And I think most people don't know that. I think they think it's this. And so there is that hater, jealousy, yeah. cutthroat way. And when you get there, it's exactly what you realize, what you just described. By the way, no one's ever said that on my show. It's one of the most powerful things anybody's ever said. It is like that. He, by the way, he was doing his hands where there's room and it's flat. And yeah. that's absolutely true. Your Someone else's success does not prevent you from being there also. That's so big. Yeah, and that's one thing. People think, oh, this person's successful. They're blocking me. That person may not even know you exist. I mean... <laughs> They don't even know you are who you are, right. nothing about you. They're not blocking you. They're just doing what they're doing. They're going through their life. And I remember back when I was playing and guys would get endorsement deals and guys would do commercials and autograph signings. The guys would complain, well, why is he getting that? And why is he doing this? And why is he doing it? And they would get mad at the guy. And I would say, if you were him and these opportunities came your way, you would take them too. So how can you be mad at him for taking advantage of what opportunities came his way? Yes. And, and that completely took a lot of the, the, you know, I've never had that kind of jealousy. And I've always realized 
when I went to Kelly or when Eli Manning came to the Giants or something like that, the new kid always gets attention. He's a new kid. Right. Everybody wants to figure him out and give him attention and show him love. So you can never get get so caught up to think that, oh, this, and then that doesn't last forever, by the way. Yeah. When you go to McDonald's and, and what's the main sandwich there, the Big Mac, right? Every once in a while, they'll bring out a McRib. Everybody gets really excited for the McRib. <laughs> but if it were on the menu all the time, eventually it just becomes, you know, another sandwich and the Big Mac is still the Big Mac. So don't be mad or jealous of the young cat who comes in and gets attention. You're still the Big Mac. Plenty for you there. You'll be fine. It's very good. And you know, it's interesting about that too, is that I'm listening to you. Success is pretty simple. And it's all the things that people waste energy and focus on that takes from just being laser focused on the task at hand. It's worrying about other people. They got there before me. Why are they getting this? What are they going to think about me? All these things we deplete our energy on. To me, like the winning for you has been simple. This is a really hard question. I already asked you another one. I watch you and sometimes I wonder this for me. I, I'm kind of a busy dude too. And I, you know, I think externally people would probably think, wow, what a really cool life. And you get to do this or that or the other thing. So I would, this is just me and you one-on-one, -on -one. no one's listening, okay? Is it worth it? Like, really, is it all it's cracked up to be? To be you, to do the things you're doing. And do you ever sit there some days, maybe it's Sunday flying back on the plane, knowing you got to get up Monday to do the show. Mm -hmm. Do you ever sit there and go, I thought I'd enjoy this more? Or I thought there'd be more to it? Or is it, this is even better than I thought? And I, I would really love to know, I think I know the answer and I don't think it's pretty for most people when we're in the moment, but I'm really curious. Look at you really thinking deep. What is the real answer to that? Is it what it's cracked up to be? Absolutely, freaking lutely it's, it's better than I ever could have imagined. I think it's probably more glamorous from the outside looking in than it is sometimes for the inside looking out. I think the day-to-day -day work may be more glamorous from the outside looking in. But the day-to-day -day work is worth it because sometimes when the mirrors are tinted, no one can see in and I'm on vacation or I'm doing cool things with my family that if I didn't do this, I'm not able to do. Or if I'm at a fight and I'm at the front row watching the biggest fight fighters in the world and I show up at a restaurant and it's like, come on in, we don't have a line. I mean, I hate to cut the line on people, but it's like <laughs> the stuff that comes your way absolutely makes it worth it. And, it, and everything I do now, this is gravy. I think that's why I look at it. That's why to me, it's, it's always going to be worth it because football, if that was worth it, what I do now is more than worth it, worth it because playing, practicing, hitting, training camp twice a day, laying on a wet ground to stretch at seven in the morning, to putting on pads that are still soaked with your sweat from the day before and it's 7 38 in the morning and got to run into another grown man for the next two hours and do that over again in the afternoon. And that was work. Mm -hmm. That was work. And that led to where I am now. Yeah. And I would go through it again to get back to where I am now. Mm -hmm. But it was the hardest thing I've ever done, which now makes talking on TV for a freaking living. Are you kidding me? I, I didn't know this was an option. Yeah. Uh, talking? <laughs> <laughs> right. You know who you are? You're grateful. I'm just listening that to I you. I am, man. You have an abundance of gratitude that's abnormal for somebody at your level who sometimes might think they've, they're entitled to it or whatever. You just have an unusual amount of gratitude. And I bet that if I met you when you were younger and playing, that that was true then too. Yeah, I, you know, and I've always been kind of a, I always tell people I'm an extroverted introvert. Me too. And if I'm in this, walking down the street and people say, hey, Michael, 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 and it makes me uncomfortable. I don't like that attention. But what if I'm doing my job and, and the that's fine. But when the cameras aren't there and I'm just in the street, I, I, I feel no different than anyone else. I don't think I have special privileges over anyone else. It's not like when I walk down the street, it lights up. 
like in the Michael Jackson video. You know, right. yeah, yeah. <laughs> I walk down the street just like everybody else. Right. But I think that there's this perception that, you know, everything that you do is always so cool and yeah. oh my goodness. And that's just not the case. Yeah. And I, I, I realized, and I'm, I, maybe it's a fear, a fear of losing humility would mean that I would lose everything that being humble has gotten me. So it makes me always stay very aware and very conscious of the, the opportunities or the, the, the things that I've been afforded from the opportunity from, from, from in my life. So that I, I'm very conscious of trying to be good to people because I feel like if I were to lose the humility, then everything else goes out the window with it. Oh my gosh. You say things that I feel better than I feel them. Like I, I, what you just said is exactly how I feel. I'm almost made, almost makes me emotional that you said it because I feel that. Like if mm -hmm. I lose my sense of humility, I think everything's going to go away, and I, it's, I'm going to lose it. I'm going to, I will have spoiled all the blessings of my life if I lose my humility. I also consider myself an, I think you said extroverted introvert or the mm -hmm. reverse. Like I'm very introverted privately, publicly I can be an extrovert. Exactly. And I just got asked what you said, and I just want to reiterate it it's a 10 million times better than you think it is. It's not as pretty or as glamorous to win and make your dreams come true, but it's 10 million times better than yeah. you think it is. And, it, and it's not the cool stuff. It's actually how you feel about yourself that you're growing, expanding as a person, mm -hmm. you having new experiences and different contributions. It's just a super cool feeling. But that, well, well, that's why I think I've done and I do so many different things. It's that feeling of figuring something out, committing to something, coming up with an idea and actually seeing it through. And, and then you, then, you know, like the clothing business, it's like, Oh, this was just an idea we had. Now it's a real legit business. hundred thousand dollar pyramid, you know? Yeah. Maybe we can host this game show. Now it's a legit big time game show. It's like, and then to learn every step of the way of thinking about how I felt when I filmed season one, to how I feel filming, you know, season six now or whatever it's going to be like the confidence and like, man, I started and I didn't know, you know, I, I kind of was looking at Dick Clark tapes going, maybe I can do this to really? now actually feeling so comfortable that I can do it in my sleep. Like, I like that feeling of progression mm. in, 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 in life and progression in projects and progression in work. And um, yeah, man, I do too. I feel like I die if I did it. I mean, it's like I'm either literally growing or dying and I, feel like the minute I stop growing, I'm going to go in reverse. I don't know how fast I'll go in reverse, but I'll just start to regress as a spirit, yeah. almost yeah. as like a spirit. No, I know and that's it's amazing because people that are not in this stuff, it's different doing GMA than it is the hundred thousand dollar. It's a different energy. It's a different studio. It's a different setting. It's a different communication. Fox NFL. Now he's on a panel. He's got to interact with other people. When are they done talking? When does he jump in, puts his yeah. hand on the guy, lets all these little things that you only learn when you do them. He did mm -hmm. not know. When he was back in Germany after his freshman year going to <laughs> college, this is proof, everybody, that we do expand as people. If we continue to work, if we continue to try new things, if we step into spaces we are not prepared for. People are afraid to fail. People are afraid to fail. And they feel like they fa if they fail, then their life is over. People are afraid to be judged. And... You can't, you can't expand. You can't get better if you're afraid of what other people's opinions are going to be if you want it on your life. Yeah. So you want to get better at something. You want to try something new. That's on you. A lot of people, and I know you've heard this before, but a lot of people tell you you can't do anything because they have their own restrictions on their, them, their life. Yes. So they take their restrictions, their fears, they put them on you. A lot of people put them on their own kids. I was fortunate enough to have a father who was fearless. I mean, this guy was in the military with five kids straight out of high school for 12, 13 years and said, I want to be an officer. I'm getting out of the military and I'm going to go to, to, to um, the ROTC program at Prairie View. Then I'm going to go back in as an officer. Whoa. And then, I, then my, I, my mom was pregnant with me. So he gets out of the military, five kids, six on the way and goes to the ROTC program at, at Prairie View University, which... They didn't want to let him into the officer's program because they said he was too old. Wow. And a chance meeting is the only reason he got in. And, and I didn't realize this until my dad wrote this whole big, wrote me, he wrote this whole like little testimony letter 
And he was saying in his testimony letter, and I'm reading it going, this is an amazing story that he, he went, he got out of the military, went to Prairie View, wanted to get into the officer program. They told him, no, you're too old. Well, he's got, you know, a mom and five kids, me on the way, a lot of mouth to feed. And a, gen, and a colonel came to the base and they were looking for more minorities to put into these, to the um, officer program. He's talking to the colonel. Colonel's telling him about it, you know, what they're trying to do. And my dad goes, yeah, I tried to get in the program. And um, they said, you know, my age and blah, 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 blah. And he said, well, soldier, where were you stationed? You know, I was in France and all these other things. And he goes, you know, I was in, when I was in France, man, I saw this boxing match. It was the, the best boxing match I'd ever seen. And he described this whole boxing match. And my dad goes, sir, that was me. Oh, my gosh. My dad was an all army boxer, Golden Globe, bo Golden Globe boxer, and in, in the military. And that colonel was talking about the boxing match you saw my dad fight in France and did not know that that was my father. Come on. And once he heard that, you're in the program. That's bananas. And then my dad graduated magna cum laude from the ROTC program as what he could say, could call him an old man. And he goes back into the Army as an officer, becomes a master jumper in the 82nd Airborne Division. Um, you know, when we moved to Germany, he was running the first CEC, Combat Equipment Company. So here's somebody who realized and was fearless to think that my life is going in a direction I want to do better. I can only do better if I'm an officer. So I'll take the chance and be fearless and get out and hopefully get into a program that is going to get me where I want to go. And he did it. And he... You know, for me, it was when, Michael, when this, when you're in the Pro Bowl, when you win the Super Bowl, when you're in the Hall of Fame, when, when, when. It's never with if, because I, I think if you tell your kids or you tell yourself if, there's doubt and if. There's no doubt and when. It just may not happen right at that moment, and sometimes it does. But when, you always think it's going to happen eventually. Oh, my gosh, Michael. That's one of the best stories I've ever heard. By the way, that, that's the so long-winded, but I'm sorry. No way. That was not long-winded. You were one meeting away. Your dad had one was one meeting away from changing One meeting away. I made that one decision. That's the deal. Speaking of the, the when and the if, by the way, that was not long-winded. That's profound. By the way, what's really crazy is the story of your life is so impressive. Little did I know that on my show, my favorite story would not be about you, be about your dad. Uh, mm -hmm. And it kind of explains you, though. But I want to go to football. We have a few moments left, but I've enjoyed this so much. Like, it's like a master class almost. But uh, you said the when and not if. So the year you guys win the Super Bowl, I want to make sure I understand it because I maybe I have it wrong and I'd like to just understand it. But you guys play the Patriots. They're undefeated and you lose. But it was a really good game. I remember watching the game. I think there was it was in New York. They came in and beat you guys, right? Yep, at the end of the game, came in and beat us. At the end of the game. And... But I, my recollection is, so they're undefeated. Uh, they've got Brady. They've got Moss. This is a juggernaut of a team. They've got, they're loaded on defense, too. They had their, really, all their studs were still on their defense then. Yeah. And, but after that game, is it right that you basically said when we beat them in the Super Bowl, not if? Like, did you know in that game that if you played them again, you could beat them? Because the reason I ask this question, why I think it's so important. Yes, you won the Super Bowl. Yes, you beat an undefeated team. Yes, Eli should have been uh, ruled in the grasp. That's a whole other story. Uh, you know, until uh, that Patriots hat, you're going to say that. But go uh, ahead, helmet okay. behind you. All right. It's all right. <laughs> but he was not in the grasp. <laughs> no. But, uh, but my, my point is that my point is that that this is from a loss. So this is a big lesson, I think, if I'm right about the story. If you had this feeling, if it was even in the locker room afterwards. It's from a defeat that you make the decision when we win. This is important because as a human being, we're suffering losses and defeats and setbacks regularly. That didn't define you. It's an undefeated team. They just beat you at your place, mm -hmm. right, at home. Is it right that after that you went, when we play them again, we're going to beat them? You got this feeling they were beatable or not? I think that was a team feeling, but the person who verbalized it, literally walking off the field after that game. We're walking off the field in defeat, and O.C. Yeminyora, our other defensive end, our right end, looked at me and said, when we meet them again, we, we when we see them again, we're going to beat them. I'm thinking to myself, that's fantastic, but only way we see them is the Super Bowl. You realize that. AFC, NFC, buddy. And 
he just he just it was just we had this confidence because we realized going into that game we knew we were in the, we were in the playoffs already. We were going to we were going to Tampa to play the Bucks. We didn't want to put anything into our 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 game plan that would show the Buccaneers what we could do. So it was a very vanilla defense and a very vanilla offense that we ran against the Patriots the last game. We didn't have anything to play for. It was pretty much, are, are the Giants going to rest their guys? The Patriots aren't resting their guys because for them, they wanted a perfect season. Mm-hmm. And I think that inspired us because they're not resting their guys. We're not going to rest our guys either. And the fact that we were just very vanilla and we went to head to head with a team who wiped everybody off the map. May was so dynamic. I think the most points in a regular in the, the average, the most points of any team in a regular season history. And, you know, they had Harrison, Seau, um, Brewski, you name it. They were so loaded. But I don't know what it was. We just felt like if that was the best that they had to give, we're better than we showed. And pre, post, uh, pregame, um, one of the press conferences, and Plastico Burr said, you know, yeah, the score is going to be like 21, 17, 21 or something. We're going to win. And Tom, who's my business partner in religion of sports and my, my boy, when he was like, huh, huh, huh. Oh, uh, yeah, okay, we're going to score like 17 points. Oh, uh, uh, okay. Like a little, you know, dismissive. That fired us up. Offensively, we just had guys who collectively or individually you would look and go, oh, you know, you know, collectively we were a team. It was a, it was the team. There was no one individual bigger than the other. There was no one individual who wanted to let another guy down. It was never a selfish thing about selfish on our team. Everything was about togetherness. And before the game, my dad go, well, when you guys win the game on Sunday and Baba, I'm not like a dad, you know, it's a big game. He goes, well, you know, I, and, and, and I said, yeah, he said, yeah, I know, but you've already won the game. Just got to go out there and go through the formalities of it now. And I'm like, geez, okay. All right. I guess you haven't been watching the film. I've been watching them beating snot out of everybody. <laughs> But we're in that game, and I give this speech right before the offense went out there when Eli got out of that, that grasp. <laughs> and, and the speech was, you know what, guys? The score was 14-10 at that point. 17-14 will be the final score. One more, 17-14, one more touchdown. We are world champions. Believe it, and it will happen. 17-14 will be the final score. And that was my way of kind of channeling my dad to say, this is how it's going to end. It's not ending how it is. You you control it. I couldn't, I wasn't on the offense. I can't do anything about it. And to see people make the most extraordinary plays in their life, from Eli to David Tyree, Plaxico catching that ball in the end zone for the touchdown. David Tyree couldn't catch a cold butt naked in the wintertime. I mean, he was not our wide receiver of choice. Um, He was a special teams guy. Due to, I mean, it's true. Eli is so clumsy that he he would fall in practice like trying to do a rollout naked bootleg, and he's fallen down. So to see those guys do extraordinary things, let me know it was more than just them. They weren't out there playing for themselves. They were out there playing for all of us, and we all played for each other. And so to win that Super Bowl, the biggest achievement, better than any. MVPs and player of the years and anything I ever earned in football. That was the one thing that you could share with everybody. The most excited I've ever been about anything in my life. And I, every day I'm on an email chain with the entire defensive line. I see Eli a few times a month. I see Sean O'Hara a few times a month. I see Amani Tuma a few times a month. I see these guys all the time. It's like a brotherhood that no matter, no matter where we are in our life, everything stops. Because once we see each other, it's like this feeling that you you can't capture with anybody else who wasn't there, wasn't a part of it. And um, yeah, most special time, man. And it was I couldn't have asked for a better ending to my career, to be honest with you. You could have played a couple more years and you chose not to. But I just got to tell you, your whole physiology, your energy, your face definitely is different when you talk about that. There's there's something just life changing, life altering, just special above everything, huh? For that, yeah. probably that, not kids or that stuff, but beyond that, it's it's that important. Yeah, you know I, mean? I mean, professionally, it was the greatest moment ever. Hmm. It is by far the greatest moment ever professionally, and 
even post football, there's nothing that compares to that one day. Nothing. You could never recreate that stage. And I'll never forget like every moment of running out at the beginning of the game to hearing, I can still hear the sound of the, just, you don't hear the audience when you're out, the crowd when you're there. You're so focused that I can hear the guy across from me breathing. I can only, I can hear Tom, yeah, check this. Hey. I can hear the linebackers. You can only hear the people you need to hear. You do not hear 80,000 people, whatever it may be, you yelling until the play is over. So you make a tackle, you make a sack, and then all of a sudden it's like they turn up the radio so you can now hear the crowd. Are you and kidding me? I've never heard this before. Your focus is so incredible. And that, ta- that actually was a lesson to me that if you really want to focus, you can block everything out. Because I've had to do it without even realizing it for football purposes. It, it's really an incredible thing because you do not hear anybody. All I hear is the quarterback. I can hear the linemen talking. I can hear my guys talking. I can hear breathing. I can hear, you know, yeah, I, like you turn your helmet and you, you click your helmet on your shoulder pad. I can hear all that, but I do not hear, did not hear the people. That's and, a thing in your brain called the reticular activating system. My audience knows I talk about this. It's the filter that allows you to focus on what's important to you, but that's the best example. I, I'm stealing that premise going to be in every talk I ever give. The fact that an athlete can be in an arena full of 80,000 people, a stadium, and not hear that noise, but can hear his helmet clicking on his shoulder pads and the breathing of the linebacker coming up on some package behind him yep. is blows my damn mind. That is mind blowing that focus can dial you in that much. Isn't that, even you saying that, that's mind blowing, right? Yep. That's incredible that the mind works that way. But I, I absolutely, that's, but I, you know, and, and I don't, I could have played a few more years, but I realized after that Super Bowl that. I just, everything I had, man, you know, I OC and Tuck used to always have this joke. We're going to kick you out the league. Oh man. They just sit in a meeting to tell me that. And I used to say, you know what, Tuck, you will always be my backup until I decide to retire. Just to like, get him back. He couldn't say, <laughs> he couldn't say anything back to me on that one because I was the starter. But what they didn't realize is when I admired Everything that they did, they inspired me because I realized these guys are younger, stronger, faster. So I slimmed down. They would go home. They didn't see that I'm back in that weight room. They didn't see me sitting in an ice tub, like just trying to take care of myself, not to stay uh, ahead of them, literally just to keep up with them. Unbelievable. So when I retired, I realized how much it took just to maintain and stay close to these guys. And that in my heart, after we won the Super Bowl, I was like, you know what? I just don't want to do it. You, by the way, you walked from a lot of money, Michael. Yeah, they offered for me to come back. It was a lot of money. And I decided that I had never cheated the game or anything. And I was not going to start now. I was not going to get out there and just do something for the money and not have my heart into it and just think, okay, mentally, I'll just get through it. Your heart's got to be in. It's too hard of a business to just show up and say, oh, I'm just going to do it for the money. At least it was for me. Because it's it's one thing to, to be on a football team and be a starter, right? There are 11 guys out there. I could have been 11 guys. I could be a starter. To be that one of the 11 who not only do you have expectations for yourself that are high, but everyone has expectations of you that every time you show up, you have to be at a certain level. You don't have the liberty to, or the ability or the, the freedom to drop below a certain expectation. Mm. And I realized without my heart, I could not reach that expectation. Now, if I still had the heart to do it, I absolutely would have gone back. Absolutely. But I felt going back just for the money would have been a disservice to, to the Giants, to the NFL, to the fans, and, and to myself. So I didn't do it. It, it, it worked out okay. <laughs> you know what timing is? Think about it. Timing, man. I thought about this. Had I gone back, um, Regis would have retired. Yeah. Someone else would have got that job because I would have basically been playing football and then would have had opportunity to do all the guest hosting and all these other things. Like, it's just the timing of everything worked out perfectly that we won a Super Bowl, which was the whole reason I was invited to go on that show as a guest in the first place for them. That's to- crazy. Who I was. It's crazy. So timing of air, timing it was incredible for all of that. So when I say a little bit of luck, yeah, it may, it may sound humble, but it's true. Luck is where opportunity and preparation meet each other. And you obviously crushed it. 
I want to keep going, but they're telling us we're out of time. So <laughs> I uh, I enjoyed this so much; it exceeded my expectations. And I'm I just want to tell you, I'm 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 grateful that you did this today. I'm so impressed with you. And um, even as this is a distant front, I'm just proud of you. The difference you're making in the world, you really inspire me. I know you inspire a lot of people, and I know you know millions of people end up viewing or watching or hearing this today. So I just wanted to say thank you, Michael, for being here, and I hope we do it again very very soon. Well, thank you, Ed, and thank you. I appreciate you having me. I've been I've been wanting to do this because you're you're inspiring me and so many people out there. So it's good to be a part of the the mission and what you're doing out there to help so many other people, man. I really, really, really appreciate it. The only one issue I have is we need to get you a new helmet at the backdrop. Send it over there. I'll put it somewhere. I'll put it somewhere. I got it. Hey, God bless everybody. Share the show today. This is epic conversation. I'm so glad we got so detailed and, um, Again, thank you, Michael Strahan. All right, everybody, God bless you. Max out. Hey, guys, thanks for sticking around. If you'd like more, click the videos right here. They're exactly what you need to see next. And if you're new here, hit subscribe and become a part of the Max Out community. And tell me what you think about the videos in the comments below. I read all of them every week, and I select winners that get all kinds of prizes, gear, coaching calls with me. Make a comment.